All right, man, peace. So for those of us who've been following the soap opera known as the NBA for the past 15 years, we know that the lead actor is someone by the name of LeBron James. And I always credit LeBron with the greatest contribution that he's made to the NBA, that being that he's opened the minds of the players to understand the true meaning of loyalty is not to an entity known as a team or corporation known as the NBA, but to yourself as your own business entity, understanding your own monetary value, you are a financial asset, and it is your responsibility to do what's best for you at all times, and also what's best for your family. So you should always embrace player mobility and the free agency process. He's taken away a lot of the facades that have been associated with so-called player loyalty to teams, and that to me has been his greatest contribution. We also know that when LeBron ends things, they normally don't end amicably because for him to go to a team, they pretty much have to promise to turn over the keys to the franchise to him in one way or another. They start to embrace the LeBron James system. They hope that he stays, he leaves, and he also leaves them in shambles. Why is that? Because they've given over the entire enterprise to him. The entire offense and defense is normally ran through him. So, of course, once he leaves, whatever's left is going to be shambles. Oftentimes, people try to assert that LeBron has a greater contribution or a greater impact on teams than other great players in the the NBA's history. And we know why they do that, because they're trying to imply that he's the greatest player of all time. And to me, the fact that these teams crumble once he leaves the implication is more that they they make their team more LeBron dependent than many of these other great players in the past. A Larry Bird, a Magic Johnson, even a Kareem or a Wilt oftentimes understood how to play within a system much better than LeBron James. And of course, we know that there are certain reasons for that. They went to college and they played within a, a framework in college. Even Michael Jordan, the Bulls were not as dependent on Michael Jordan as LeBron's teams have been with him because he only knows how to play one style of play. But that gets us to his rapport with Mr. Pat Riley, who, as we all know, is one of the top alpha males in the NBA. And eventually they clashed, which helped precipitate LeBron James leaving the Miami Heat and going back to Cleveland. But he was going to do that anyway because that was part of his narrative. He had to return home. He had to re-ingratiate himself with that region because that's where he's from. And I also believe that he's planning on buying the Cleveland Cavaliers once he retires. And how could he do that if the city and the state still had feelings of antipathy for him? So that was a great strategic move by LeBron. Well, Pat Riley has written a book in which he's pretty much issued a mea culpa to LeBron James. And one must wonder if he's also planning on wooing LeBron back to Miami. Anyway, they're going to talk about it. I'm going to chime in. Speaking of LeBron, in an excerpt from Ian Thompson's new book, The Soul of Basketball, Pat Riley had some interesting insight on LeBron's time in Miami, basically on him leaving the Heat to return to the Cavs. Riley admits this. I had two to three days of tremendous anger. I was absolutely livid, which I expressed to myself and my closest friends. I wonder how many times the N-word came out when he was by himself livid like that. Or with his closest friends. I wonder. <laughs> Pat Riley is an alpha. He only knows how to operate one way. He's never going to be deferential to anyone else. He and LeBron are not going to get along. LeBron is also an alpha. But because LeBron was not raised around a strong male element. He exhibits a lot of feminine traits. I'm pretty sure that that is one of the main reasons why Pat Riley was so frustrated. Because LeBron did not give him the quote-unquote respect that Pat Riley felt he deserved in conversing with him, being communicative, and letting him know what what he was thinking about. And I think that that is one of the main reasons why Pat Riley was so quote-unquote livid. A beautiful plan all of a sudden came crashing down. That team in 10 years could have won five or six championships. I doubt it. You guys only had two in four years. I don't know how many more you thought that you were going to get even with LeBron at the helm. But, I mean, knowing Pat Riley, 
he most likely had a master scheme where he thought that he was going to supplement LeBron with younger, better talent and even consider getting rid of Dwayne Wade if need be. But we'll never know. I get it. I get the whole chronicle of LeBron's life. He did the right thing. I just finally came to accept the realization that he and his family said, you'll never ever be accepted back in your hometown if you don't go back to try to win a title. Otherwise, someday you'll go back there and have the scarlet letter on your back. You'll be the greatest player in the history of mankind, but back there, nobody's really going to accept you. Absolutely. Ding, ding. Pat Riley, good job. And also the fact that LeBron James was trying to escape that that Kabbalah mafia that was headquartered in Miami under Yeshayahu Pinto who were harassing him. But I've already covered that in another video. All right. Allegedly, that's another reason why LeBron left. Stephen, it seems like Riley ultimately got it as time passed. What's your reaction to his comments there? Well, I applaud Pat Riley. Um, class personified at the end of the day. Uh, because he told the truth. Um, I'm not one of his closest friends, I can tell you that much. Uh, but, you know, he and I have spoken on, on a few occasions, um, and that was certainly an emotion that he expressed to me. So what he said in the book is exactly what he said to me around that time. I saw him the next month after uh, LeBron James had decided to leave Miami, and those were his emotions. Uh, he stated them absolutely accurately. The two to three days, he was absolutely livid. And then as time went on, it quelled a little bit and uh, he calmed down. Uh, in the end, one of the things that you didn't see in that quote, there is a level of culpability of responsibility that Pat Riley had to accept in all of this. Uh, yes, that being that he thought that he was going to deal with LeBron James, how he dealt with many of the athletes that he was accustomed to in the 80s and 90s. And LeBron James showed him, no, I'm not that guy. I'm not Magic, I'm not Patrick Ewing, I'm not John Starks, I'm not Anthony Mason, I'm not Alonzo Mourning, I'm not Tim Hardaway, I'm not D. Wade. I'm not going to follow you around like you're my dad. And that's one thing that I give LeBron credit for, even though oftentimes I know that it's very clear in the way that he expresses himself that he missed a lot of that, that masculine energy in his formative years. He has attained a level of of regality in, in how he views himself. He respects himself and that he knows that he's worth a lot to other people. So therefore he should be worth a lot to himself in his own mind. And that's part of the great deal of respect that LeBron James deserves and regard that he deserves and how he's influenced the other players in the NBA to view themselves with great value and not conform to that paradigm of being loyal to a team. You should never be loyal to a team. It's like for Regular brothers out there working at a job, you shouldn't be loyal to your job. You do your job. That's why they compensate you. Other than that, when you get better opportunities, you move along with your life. That's what life is about, trying to improve yourself every day. And LeBron James, in regards to that aspect of how he lives and what he does, he's done a phenomenal job, especially in how he's influenced others. LeBron James was not perfect. Uh, when Pat Riley and those guys came to Vegas, uh, Pat Riley perhaps should have shown more respect to a guy like Rich Paul, uh, who was representing LeBron. But LeBron himself should have shown more respect to Pat Riley and, and Andy Elkin and Lonzo and those boys. He was sitting there on some PlayStation playing and barely would look at Pat Riley. This yes, because that was his way of letting Pat Riley know that I tolerated your ass for four years. I tolerated your disrespect. My team tolerated your disrespect. I've learned what I've needed to learn here. I've gotten my two championships. It's time to head back. You were basically just a rebound chick. Cleveland was my main woman. That was the love of my life. I rebounded with you. You had big titties. You had a fat booty. You were good looking. But you know, you couldn't really cook. We always had to eat out. So now I'm going back to the chick that I grew up with that I always loved and who knows how to prepare a nice home cooked meal. You didn't know how to treat me, so I'm heading back. We had, we know we have four good years. Now kick rocks. He went to four straight NBA Finals and won two chips. These are the kind of things that transpired. Wasn't that much was said, but your, lang your body language, your dismissiveness, the fact that you were the man, you were the coveted prize, uh, you wore that on your sleeve a little bit, and it came across as disrespectful, which is something. 
Yes, to Pat Riley, I'm sure that it did seem dismissive and disrespectful from LeBron because Pat Riley is used to being the proverbial bell of the ball. He's used to being the person who can approach other athletes, particularly in the, in the NBA, and tell them, this is what you're going to get by coming here. And plus, of course, LeBron James was the centerpiece for his future plans. He was willing to get rid of D-Wade. If he, if he would have called LeBron James in the office while they were negotiating, and LeBron would have told him, I want to stay here, but we have issues with our roster. I love Dwayne, but I don't know if he's going to be able to be a real part of this team if we're going to have reasonable and realistic chances of winning another championship, I guarantee you Pat Riley would have said no problem. He's out of here. Kevin Durant's going to become a free agent in a couple of years. We're going to build around you and him. I'm, I'm definitely sure that Pat Riley would have done anything to keep LeBron. That's why he's so disappointed because he thought that LeBron James should have felt grateful for coming to Miami and learning how to win. While LeBron James, in his mind, was saying, I'm as equally responsible for our victories as this culture is. Because you guys were not winning shit before I got here, other than that lucky championship that you got back in 06 with D. Wade and Shaq. I'm sure that LeBron was saying that because, remember, the Heat were definitely in the doldrums before LeBron James got back there. I think the year before that, Dwayne had had a bounce back season and they won around 40, 42 games, somewhere around there. But uh, LeBron knows his self worth, and that's a great thing. That contributed to the ang to the anger that Pat Riley um, had held, and I've spoken to several people who confirmed that. So let's be clear about that. But in the same breath, I also say that Pat Riley couldn't escape culpability because Pat. But it wasn't something intentionally negative. Pat Riley Max is old school to the core. There's a way that he goes about doing things. There's a way his belief system is what it is. And Pat Riley, whether he wants to admit it or not, there's a hierarchy. There's a chain. Everybody ain't Alonzo Mourning. Everybody ain't Dwayne Wade. To a lesser degree, everybody ain't Tim Hardaway. Special people. There are people who are special to him. And then LeBron was just an absolutely phenomenal, fabulous player. He happened to have, but he wasn't like those guys. And you know what, Steve? I'm sure that in LeBron's mind, Pat Riley was not held in high esteem within his mind either. And that's truly what bothered Pat. Pat Riley's like one of those girls who's used to getting hit on. And then she encounters the guy who's not paying her any mind. And she becomes even more inquisitive about this guy. And after a while, she becomes disdainful of that guy because he's not giving her the level of obeisance that she's accustomed to from other men. People like Tim Hardaway and Alonzo Mourning, when they came to Miami, they were viewed almost as cast-offs. People forget Alonzo was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets. He got into an issue with his teammate, Larry Johnson. Um, they ended up moving Alonzo, and then eventually moving Larry Johnson as well. Uh, Tim Hardaway was great in his early years with the Golden State Warriors. He had knee issues. He ended up getting moved to, to Miami. Pat Riley and and uh, Pat Riley was able to rebuild the image and the self confidence of Tim Hardaway and Alonzo, and make them a team that was a threat to the Bulls in the late '90s. They always talk about the New York Knicks. The New York Knicks were no more of a threat to the Chicago Bulls of the late '90s than Miami was. Miami played the Bulls in the conference finals in '97. I mean, the series only went five games, but they were there. And they were not a team that was filled with great talent up and down their roster, but they did have a bunch of pit bulls on their roster. And they were, they were willing to go to war for Pat Riley. LeBron James is willing to go to war for himself, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and as a result, because of that, not to say that that would have kept LeBron or made him leave, it's simply to say that if you're Pat Riley and you have that kind of commodity in your camp, you've got to know that you might have to sit up there and acquiesce just a little bit or whatever the case would be. Again, it was nothing intentional. It's just that, and, and, and Pat Riley doesn't walk around trying to mistreat people. That's not him. I love the man personally. But it's just that it's clear that there's levels to this. And the level of the relationship that he has with an Alonzo Mourning 
That's like a son to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, D. Wade, especially when D. Wade was gone, he had his business and D. Wade's decision wanting to talk to Mickey Arison and Nick Arison instead of Pat Riley directly before he decided to leave. You could, Pat Riley could say, okay, you could do that. But at the end of the day, that man loves himself some D. Wade. He loves himself some from some Alonzo Mourning. He respects the hell out of LeBron James. You have no choice. But that doesn't mean that the love was there. The professional relationship. You got to look at it that way. Max? Pat Riley is angling to get LeBron James back. That's what this is about. Okay. I think that that's a slight part of it. I don't, I'm not sure if that's the main aspect. But that's a slight part of it. At the end of the day, if LeBron would have signed back with the Miami Heat, He's going to be 34 years old this December. I mean, really, how many years does he have left as a championship-level leader of a team? I mean, but I'm sure that that's a slight part of it. Pat Riley's just angling to get him back. Listen, this is what... Pat Riley is defectively competitive. Some people, like Michael Jordan, fits into this category. He has a defectively competitive personality. I agree with that. I agree with that. That's why I often state, uh, for many people... Their gift is also their curse. And for the most part, the more heightened or more intense your gift, uh, the, the more heightened the curse aspect of that gift is as well. It oftentimes can spill over into other aspects of your life that can cause a deleterious effect on your life if you're not careful, if you're not able to keep your gift within its proper parameters. As opposed to someone like Magic Johnson or... LeBron James, who are super competitive, but somehow it doesn't kind of poison their personalities in a certain way. Pat Riley, there's no rebuild, there's no process with Pat Riley, Stephen A. It's, we are going to try our best to win every year. And they're competitive, and you see Pat Riley teams play with heart, this year included. And Pat Riley was upset when LeBron James left, because LeBron James is the best player on the planet. He was Pat Riley. He was on Pat Riley's team, and suddenly he wasn't. And Riley knew, oh, we're not winning any championships anytime soon without that guy. And now he feels, I think, that there is an opening to get LeBron back. And I think he's probably right. Stephen A., you've discussed Miami as a... It's possible. I have not really touched on that aspect, but I think it would also depend on who else Pat Riley could bring in. Because LeBron is just not going there just to go there. There are a couple of advantages that Miami would have. He's been there already. Uh, the fan base knows him. It's a tax-free state. Uh, but I think that LeBron, he's ready to move to somewhere new. But, I mean, you never know. We'll see what happens. Others, and it seems reasonable to uh, deduce that Miami is a legitimate landing spot for LeBron James. I think Pat Riley knows that. And this is about angling to get that dude back. Stephen A., That's interesting. we changed under Pat Riley's feet like... He came into the he came into coaching with Kareem Abdul Jabbar as his center. He goes to the Knicks because he sees Patrick Ewing there. Oh, I got another big man. And back then, and for most of NBA history, you needed a big to be great. And Michael Jordan, a great two-way wing, came, and the Knicks got no wins, and neither did neither did the Heat. Absolutely, absolutely, and that is why I've stated that Michael Jordan is my number one all-time greatest player. Why is that? It's not because of any of the meanderings of the liberal sports media but just from what i saw with my own eyes how he was able to change the paradigm for winning in the nba prior to michael jordan it was commonly known that you had to have a dominant big man as well as a dominant wing in order to have a chance to win a championship he was the first player in nba history who was able to win that many championships without not even having just a dominant center or dominant big but really just a serviceable big. Luke Longley was a cast-off. Bill Cartwright was a very good defensive center who was on his last legs. And other than Isaiah Thomas, you really can't name another player in NBA history who led a team that did not have a dominant center to multiple championships, at least in that era. Now, we know um, pretty much from 2010 onward, the, the paradigm has shifted and you don't really need a dominant center to win anymore. But prior to that, most of the teams that you see that have won championships, they've had, from, from the very least, a very good to a dominant center. And Jordan altered all of that. Finally, in LeBron, he got 
his Jordan. Maybe not personality-wise, maybe that was more Wade. But in terms of the fact that he had the best two-way wing in the game, he wants that guy back because he knows well, he ain't winning no championships without him. Is there merit well, to that statement? Well, 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 look, first of all, let me give Max a lot of credit because Max, that could very well be exactly what Max is saying. I'll take right The ahead. only thing that I would say to you in response to that, Max, is that his comments in this upcoming book are consistent with the comments he expressed weeks after LeBron departed. So that's what I'm saying. It's not like he hasn't spoken at all to anybody and then this book comes out and now we're hearing something. This is something that he said almost four years ago when LeBron left. So I'm saying... Yes, well, you know what, Steve? And I agree t with your point that a lot of what Max says bears credence. I don't think that it's the prime mover as to why Riley said what he said, but there is a component of there may be a chance for me to lure this guy back if for the very least or if at the very least for three or four years probably the last three or four years of his career where he's going to be a top player and maybe I could build a little bit around him for two or three of those years and we could see what happens but I don't think that he's going to keep any candles lit for LeBron to come back I'm applauding Pat Riley for the consistency which lends itself towards it being a bit more honest and I think if there's one lesson to learn from all of this let me take a moment I make, I make it a point. Those of us who cover this league, we know all the agents. We, we, we know, we, we know the, the great Bill Duffy's of the world. And, and Henry Thomas just passed away. God rest his wonderful soul. What a good man he was. And the Jeff Wexler's of the world. Dan Fagan passed away. God rest his soul. Uh, he represented the White Howard when the White Howard departed from L.A. to get to Houston and all of that other stuff. There's a lot of great agents. Rich Paul has arrived. Rich Paul, supposedly LeBron's guy. He also has Tristan. He's got JR. He's got Ben Simmons, for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And if you have John Wall, he's got him too. This man has arrived. And one of the things that if, if LeBron is to be applauded about anything is that for those that might have the tendency to look at somebody like a Rich Paul and say, just shove him aside. We don't have to deal with him. That might have been. I'm not saying that was Pat Riley, but that might. Well, I'm saying that, that that was Pat Riley. Pat Riley, despite all of the assertions by Stephen A. Smith that uh, Pat loves Alonzo Mourning and Tim Hardaway and Dwayne Wade, at the end of the day, and certain people might not like this, I really don't give a damn. Pat Riley is a damn near 70-year-old Caucasian man. Please understand that he played at Kentucky under Adolph Rupp, who himself was a renowned racist. I'm not calling Pat Riley a renowned racist. But at that age, coming from the environment that he came from, there is a certain way that he's programmed to look at so-called black men. And of course, he's going to hold certain black athletes in higher esteem that he knows are going to directly affect his own future, his own prominence, and his own success. And he's going to look at a regular black man completely differently from he does an athlete, someone who's going to benefit him and is there for entertainment purposes. So... It's very common for a person to see a, a so-called black man who uh, is trying to exhibit a form of authority with his brain as opposed to his body with disdain. I doubt very little that Pat Riley was, was dismissive of Rich Paul. I, I doubt that very little. It's been how people were inclined to come across back in the day. That can't be the case now, not only because of what Rich Paul has accomplished in terms of his clientele, but also because LeBron's not having it. His crew is his crew. And if you want to deal with LeBron, you're going to have to deal with them brothers. You're going to have to deal with Adam Edelson. You've got to deal to with Rich Riley. Paul. you have to deal with Maverick Carter. You've got to get over that and understand it's a package deal with LeBron. Take it or leave it. And that must appeal to Pat Riley when he yes. has, I'm not saying, by the way, when you said he said this four years ago, it has the, the happy circumstance, the coincidence of being true, right? So if that yes. actually expresses Pat Riley's real feelings and it helps him lure LeBron back or give him a landing place in Miami, that's a good situation. I also think that Pat Riley just had to accept a certain perspective so that he could live with himself. It's like anything else in life that might disappoint you. In order for you to continue to be a functional human being, you have to accept that reality. 
whether it's a job that you wanted, a woman that you wanted, a woman that you couldn't keep, uh, a car that you wanted to buy, a house that you wanted to buy. When those things don't come to fruition, you may be disappointed for a while. But if you dwell on it too long, it's going to stop you from being able to progress to something that is potentially better. Or just an alternative. We have to live with reality. So once again, Pat Riley is an alpha male. So he's not going to dwell on a situation for too long. He's going to be passionate. Uh, he is going to be resentful. But he is going to face the facts. Because he knows that in a leadership position, you can't hold on to what's passed for too long. Because you have decisions to make that are going to affect your organization and you have to be clear-headed. For Pat Riley, but once he takes a step back and has a little has a little space to look at it and he can contextualize it, I think you're right, but he could also appreciate the fact that LeBron is loyal to those around him who are not just that they're loyal to him, but they can get the job done. Absolutely. Those are his people and you're going to have to deal with them. And Pat Riley is the same way. He has his, you mentioned it, Dwayne Wade, Alonzo Mourning. In New York, obviously, is Patrick Ewing. And in L.A., Magic Johnson. You can't mess with those guys with, mm -hmm. with Pat Riley around. That, those are his guys. And LeBron has his guys. Yeah, maybe it's a combination of both. You know, he's speaking the truth, but also potentially would love to obviously land LeBron again. Of course he wants LeBron back. Don't sleep on Rock Nation either. They're doing big things, too. They are doing big things. Jay-Z with my man Juan Perez. They are big time. More King James. Oh, Molly, you're just a big groupie. Talking about don't sleep on Rock Nation. Anytime Molly hears anything about a so-called black man, she just gets her panties all in the tizzy. But anyway, we'll see what happens with LeBron in the offseason. He is going to be the belle of the ball. He'll love that. Could he end up in Miami? Who knows? It depends on the package that Pat Riley is willing to offer in regards to what his prognostications will be for the Miami Heat over the next couple of seasons. Who else Pat plans on bringing in? The problem with Miami is that they have... So many prohibitive contracts. They have so many marginal players making eight figures a year. Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't know if, he, if he's going to be able to unload them. I don't know exactly what their contractual obligations are to many of those marginal players. And I'm sure that LeBron is not going to, ha he's not going to want to come back to play. What's this dude's name again? Uh, oh, yeah, Deion Waiters. <laughs> I'm sure that LeBron is not going to want to have to come back to Miami and play with that guy. I don't know anybody in the NBA who wants to play with Deion Waiters. He makes J.R. Smith look like Albert Einstein. I mean, <laughs> give me a break. But anyway, peace.